Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video we're taking you on a trip to Mount Grace Priory, a late 14th century Carthusian monastery on the western borders of the North York Moors. The Priory was the last monastery to be founded and one of the few that was founded in Britain during the period of the Black Death. It not only has evocative ruins, but it also boasts a large manor house and one of the best preserved examples of monastic horticulture. So join us whilst we wander here at Mount Grace Priory. You may ask what a Carthusian is. It's a monastic order which was founded in 1084 by a group of monks who wanted to emulate the harsh, contemplative lives of the early Christian hermits, who then formed a small community in the Chartreuse Mountains near Grenoble in France. From that point on, the new monastic order spread across Europe, and the monks soon became known as Carthusian and their priories as charter houses. The Priory itself is unusual in several respects. First, not many Carthusian monasteries were found in England, and the Order never gained popularity of orders such as the more well-known orders, like Augustinians, Benedictines or Cistercians. One of the reasons for that lack of popularity is that the Carthusians were a very strict order. The monks would wear hair shirts and live their lives in isolation, echoing the lifestyle of early Christian hermits. Unlike other orders which ate, drank, slept and worked together, the Carthusians had private cells and lived in silence, devoting their whole existence to solitary contemplation and working in their garden plots. They did gather for worship though, in the Priory Church three times a day and ate silent meals as a group on Sundays and holy days, but much of their existence was solitary and silent, living their lives again as hermits. People might find this idea odd to be like that, but in reality the monastic way of life in the Carthusian order could be very convenient for some people's lives, even in this day and age. The Carthusians played an important part in the events that led up to Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s. The order led opposition to the Act of Succession of 1534, which legitimised Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn, even despite the Pope's refusal to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. The prior of the London Charter House, John Horton, and two of the other priors refused to swear to the Act of Supremacy that later passed that year, acknowledging Henry as Supreme Head of the Church in England. The King had ultimately hoped for the support of the Carthusians, whose opinions carried great importance. Their popularity and their refusal to deny the authority of the Pope were seen as a serious threat to the government. Henry then ordered his general, Thomas Cromwell, to break their resistance. So in May of 1535, Horton, Robert Lawrence and Augustine Webster were tried for treason and executed at Tyburn in London. By the 1540s, all of the charter houses in England had been suppressed and Carthusian resistance to the Reformation was well and truly crushed. Apart from the church, the most fascinating feature at Mount Grace is the Great Cloister, arranged to provide living quarters for up to 15 monks. As its name implies, the Great Cloister is much larger than most monastic cloisters, simply due to the space that was required for so many individual cells. One of the cells has been furnished so that it can give visitors a good look and an idea of how a Carthusian monk would have lived. The word cell conjures up an image of a dingy space with bars on the windows, but this was far from the case at the Priory. The cell was a reasonably large house with a kitchen and a living room, space for prayer and studies, a sizeable bedroom on the ground floor, and just above, visited by a steep staircase, there would have been a workshop where things like weaving and clothing would be masterfully created. Not only did the monks have their own home, they would also enjoy their own private kitchen garden, as well as a toilet at the end of the garden with running water. 
The standard of living of the monks and the standard of hygiene would have been much better than experienced by the majority of the population of the time. But I don't know how many people would be able to put up with the life and work and prayer where there would have been very little contact with other human beings. Each cell would have its own water supply, fed by a spring on the nearby hillside, channelled to a now vanished water tower, then through a system of lead pipes to each cell. These cells were originally built of timber, but were rebuilt in stone around 1420. You can easily trace the system of stone line drain channels, which link the individual cells to the main drain system. The water supply and drainage system is quite remarkable, for it was built at a time when even the largest and most expensive homes of the nobility had underdeveloped water supplies, and long before most large cities had adequate water and sewage systems. I was particularly impressed with the cell garden that we're able to walk along. The cell gardens at the Priory provided monks with the opportunity for some manual labour within the confines of their own cell, which was a key part of the Carthusian ideal. They also had biblical associations, including the original Garden of Eden, or to paradise itself. These spaces were not only just for food production, but it had multiple functions of spirituality, health and utility. The mass of food for the monks came from much larger kitchen gardens, plots and farms elsewhere. What I thought was interesting is that the layout of the gardens would be sectioned off, in which the monks would keep the more poisonous plants in one section, and the other more decorative plants in another. This could include a mix of medicinal and aromatic herbs and flowering plants to lift the mind and spirit to aid contemplation. The varieties of plants used were not only for eating or for medicinal purposes, but also a drink was made from the plant wormwood, still used to this day by the order of the Chartreuse Priory in a drink called Green Chartreuse, Two monks made this concoction made from a secret recipe that has the taste of absinthe, but much more sweeter. The most striking visible remain of the church is the early 15th century bell tower, which dominates the entire monastic site. As we enter inside the Priory Church, it was originally a very simple rectangular building, but around the 1420s it was enlarged to act as a suitable burial place for Thomas Beaufort, the Duke of Exeter. The base of Beaufort's tomb can still be seen, near the remains of the monk's stalls. Chapels were added to the north and south of the nave in the late 15th century to provide a burial place for patrons of the priory. In the early 16th century, a third chapel was added to the south of the choir. In the northeast corner of the Great Cloister is a small walled garden. Interestingly, it was in this garden that the monks were traditionally buried. There is a cell for the prior, and though larger than those for the individual monks, 
it is much smaller and less comfortable than those of the Augustinian or Cistercian abbots. Life in a Carthusian monastery was not easy, and there would have inevitably have been problems with discipline. If a monk broke the strict rules of the order, they could be sent to the prison, which was a three-storied structure in the southwest corner of the Great Cloister. Monks from other Carthusian priories might also be sent to Mount Grace to be incarcerated in the prison. After Mount Grace was closed by Henry VIII in 1539, its monks were pensioned off and the manor became a gentleman's residence. It was extended in the 17th century by Thomas Lassell. He added two new wings to the house during the Commonwealth period, when England was ruled by Oliver Cromwell. By the 1800s though, the property had fallen into disrepair and faced a bleak future. It was then bought by Sir Isaac Lothian Bell, who had made his fortune in the steel industry. There are beautiful graduated gardens to the front of the house with stunning floral borders and water features that we can enjoy. His purchase proved to be a turning point for the manor house. Not only was he an advocate for the arts and crafts movement, he was also a leading light in the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. He preserved both monastic and commonwealth features whilst adding his own arts and crafts twist, including square black leaded windows which are still visible today. Sir Lothian Bell employed leading designers and spent three years on the makeover and restoration. Even today the site is very secluded it's miles away from anywhere and surrounded by woodland. The traffic on the A19 rushes past, mainly oblivious to the fact that the Priory is here. But what a hidden gem this Priory really is. The site is accessed off the A19, where you can explore the 13 acres of gardens, relax at the Orchid Cafe, walk through the 13th century manor house with exhibits, and understand more about this less known religious order. Mount Grace Priory is maintained by the English Heritage, but National Trust and English Heritage members can both access the site for free with their memberships. The site is partly accessible for wheelchair users and all facilities are kept and maintained in great condition for your visit. So that's it for this week. We hope that you've really enjoyed our visit today at Mount Grace Priory, hopefully giving you some inspiration to visit here and the surrounding area. Please be sure to like, subscribe and leave us a comment below. We would also like to thank our Patreons and our channel members for their continued support and all of the links to support us are in the description box below if you would like to help us continue to grow. So we'll see you in the next one, till next time.